All right, this is the first video of chapter four. We're talking about samples and surveys. Uh, the first question here to start us off, it says, what's the difference between a population, a sample, and a census? So let's start with population. Uh, and the definite of population in this sense uh, is the entire group of individuals that we want to learn information about. So whatever specific group that might be, that might be all students at Lake Park High School, that might be all residents of Roselle, or it could be all the senior citizens living in the state of Illinois, for example. So we have our population, we define that, and then from that, we can collect a sample. And so our sample is just a group within the population from which we actually collect data. So we actually obtain some data on our sample. So you can see that illustrated here. The sample, some people call it a subset of the population. And then lastly, a census. A census is where we collect data on every single individual in the population. The United States does a census every 10 years where they thoroughly try to reach every single person in their population and collect data on them. The thing is, in most cases, taking a census isn't really practical to try to reach every single individual in the population. So what we do uh, is hopefully we obtain a random sample, a smaller subset from that population, and then once we've collected that data from our sample, we can then make an inference about the entire population as a whole. Certainly more efficient than running a census, and sometimes that's the best we can do, is to take a sample from a larger population and then use that sample to make inferences about the larger population. So the first example here says to identify the population and sample in each of the following settings. Part A says the student government at a high school surveys 100 of the students at the school to get their opinions about a change to the bell schedule. So let's start with what the population would be. Now, they only spoke to 100 students in their survey, but they're going to use those opinions from those 100 students to hopefully represent the entire student body of the high school. So that would be the population they're interested in learning about. And then their sample would be the people they actually collected data on. So the sample would just be the 100 students that they talked to. Part B says, the quality control manager at a bottling company selects a sample of 10 cans from the production line every hour to see if the volume of the soda is within acceptable limits. So the population in this case, the thing we're trying to get a bigger idea about, would be all of the soda cans produced within that given hour, not just the 10 that were collected. Whereas our sample in this case would be those tin cans that were actually pulled from the production line and observed. So going back to our picture here, uh, we'd like to obtain a sample that is representative of the entire population. So how can we go about doing that? The first note here says, choosing a representative sample from a large varied population is not that easy. So then what are the three steps for best practice in planning a sample survey? The first step, uh, we need to actually identify or define the population that we're interested in. So we need to decide who or what it is we want to learn about. And so that's our population. And then from there, the second step is we need to say exactly what we want to measure within that population. And then step three, we're going to decide how to choose a sample from that population that we're interested in.
So start by identifying exactly what group you'd like to learn about, then what exactly you want to measure about that group, and then we'll decide how we're going to choose our sample from the population. And so the next part here talks about what not to do, how to sample badly. The first question there, what will poor sampling methods create in our results? They will absolutely create bias in our results. And we're not talking about bias like you favor one person over another person. We're talking about the statistical definition. So what's the statistical definition of bias? That means we're using a value that will consistently overestimate or underestimate the value we want to measure or know about. So just to be clear, that's the statistical definition of bias, something that consistently overestimates or underestimates the value we're interested in knowing about. So what types of sampling methods would create bias in our results? The first type of method, which would be an error on the survey designer, would be convenience sampling. And convenience sampling means choosing individuals in the population who are close to us, who are easy to reach. Another way to term that would be like a lazy type of sampling. So example two says, does the following scenario create a bias? A survey is taken at a football game featuring a question. Do you support or oppose cuts to the athletic budget? So the bias here is created by the fact that this is a convenient sample. Just to give you an idea, the way the data was collected, do you think that this survey is representative of some larger population? The results of this survey probably wouldn't be representative of members of the entire school or of the entire community. Uh, and the reason being is because it was taken right in front of the football game. So individuals at the game would most likely oppose athletic budget cuts more than the general population would on average. The reason being is the people at the football game probably enjoy the sport and would probably not like to see the athletic budget be cut. The second error method is voluntary response sampling. The definition of voluntary response sampling, and this is an error method, is a sample that consists of people who choose themselves by openly responding to some general invitation. For example, most social media polls would be subject to voluntary response sampling. People can choose whether or not they'd like to be included in the survey. And the note below here says voluntary response samples show bias because people with strong opinions, often in the same direction as each other, are most likely to respond. Just like in any social media poll or survey you might post, only the people who really feel strongly enough to respond are going to be the ones that actually fill out and complete your poll or survey. So the last example here says, identify the sampling method in each of the following scenarios, and then explain how each could lead to bias. So part A says, the ABC program Nightline once asked whether the United Nations should continue to have its headquarters in the United States. Viewers were invited to call one telephone number to respond yes and another for no. More than 186,000 callers responded and 67% said no. So for starters, the error in which this survey was designed was that it's subject to voluntary response sampling. And the reason this is a voluntary response sample is because 
only those who feel strongly enough to respond are going to take the time and effort to call in. So this sort of open polling idea leads to a voluntary response sample. And that means that 67% rate of no's is probably an overestimate. So this sample probably overestimated the percentage of no's. And that's what the statistical definition of bias is, right? Something that consistently overestimates or underestimates the value we want to measure. Part B says you want to conduct a survey to analyze students' opinions on the quality of food served in the cafeteria. The survey question you ask is, do you think that the quality of food served in the student cafeteria is acceptable? To gather opinions, you stand outside the cafeteria before lunch period and randomly ask students as they walk in the door. So this is a clear example of the other type of error method we talked about. And that's a convenience sample. And the reason this is subject to convenience sampling is because the way the data was collected, uh, you're only sampling students as they walk into the cafeteria. So that largely favors those who are not necessarily opposed to the food, which is you know, why they're walking into the cafeteria at lunchtime. Not to mention, they're probably hungry in the moment you ask them. So for that reason, the bias in this case seems like the survey would consistently overestimate the supporters of the cafeteria food. All right, so we've talked about a population, a sample, a census. We've also talked about collecting data and ways to not collect data or error methods. So that's all for these notes. I'll see you in class.